PD control is one form of linear controller we use to regulate a motor. I'm going to show a simulated example to explain some of the ideas. This is using the WeBots robot simulator. This is the uh, in the controls package on the course site um, as clock demo. So it's a simulated clock. It's a large scale clock, one meter in diameter, and the hands are independent. They have slightly different dynamics for having slightly different uh, inertia properties, but each has an independent torque motor at the base. Not a realistic clock, but a good demo for controls. So just to see how this looks, let's run a, a test to begin. So I'm going to simulate here. And we'll see the hands oscillate and slowly converge to the current wall clock time. So a few things to note. One is the two hands are behaving slightly differently. Each is what we say is underdamped. There's overshoot and ringing as they move past the given position and then oscillate before they finally come to rest at the given target. In fact, the rod one is actually still oscillating now. So just as comparison, I'm going to pause it and, re and restore. Let's, um, let's slightly increase the, what we call the damping gain, the D term, and run it again. And indeed, now we'll see that there's some overshoot, but much less, and it quickly converges to the current time. That's a basic sort of premise of PD control. The P term is putting a torque into the system proportional to the air, acting much like a virtual spring between a uh, reference position, a desired position, and the actual position. And the D term is adding a damping, which is a velocity proportional term, which tends to remove mechanical energy from the system. It acts much like a virtual damper. I say virtual because in both cases, these are calculated torques applied via the motor, and there's no physical uh, spring or damper involved. So let's look a little at the code that, that produces this. It's in Python as a demo. Um, a few things of note. First, this is not using the WeBots internal PID control loops. This is using a torque mode where it computes the torques directly and applies torques directly to the motors. So the loop here is running about um, 20 milliseconds per sample, which is 50 hertz sampling rate on reading sensors and recalculating torques. Um, with that, let's go right to the bottom and look really at the actual control function. And if we look down here at lines 88 and 89, uh, the algebra here almost directly matches the sort of mathematical formulation of the controller. A torque is computed, and the first term is P gain times, it's a, it's a target angle derived from the time, minus the actual angle of the hand. Those are expressed in radians. So that multiplies this constant times an error in radians to get a torque. On the right is a second term, which is d gain times, and then a, it's a velocity estimation. So that basically assumes a reference velocity, a desired velocity of zero, which is implicit in the algebra, and says that for a positive velocity, it'll multiply it times this constant and produce a small negative torque, which tends to resist the velocity. And that'll tend to remove mechanical energy from the system. Most of the rest is bookkeeping. There's some limitations to kind of constrain the values within the simulated motor bounds. And then the, uh, in lines 94, 95 here, the set torque method is called to apply those computed torques to the model. And that's a perfectly simulated motor model. So um, the result is very close to kind of mathematical uh, uh, idealizations. A few more things to note here. The simulator only provides a position sensor that produces positions but not velocities. So in this case, we do finite differencing where we keep track of the previous position from every cycle and then just use the difference of position to estimate the velocity. Um, and we see that here uh, in lines 82 and 83, d minute dt is a, this difference of this in angle and the previous angle divided by a small value, which is the 20 milliseconds of the sampling interval. On the simulator, this works fine. The simulator has uh, infinite precision, you know, well, numerical precision uh, re reporting of the simulated position in this case. There's no noise. The timing is very precise. And so this produces a very clean, uh, noise-free velocity estimate. In practice on real robots, this can be quite hard to get. Real sensors have either noise, like analog sensors, or discretization errors, like encoders. And those, those properties mean that the velocity estimates are often quite noisy, or at least delayed and laggy with respect to when they actually were measured. So that's, a, uh, that's sort of a hint of that, that the simulator makes some things easier than the physical world. Um, there's some other bookkeeping to basically keep track of the elapsed time and then use that to move the hands at the actual time rate. At least simulated time here is assumed to be real time. So let's go back up to the, to the top here 
and try one more experiment with the game. Really, two more experiments. Uh, first is, um, if we actually set it to zero instead of something positive, we set it from a 0.01 to 0.05 and we got better damping. Let's set it to zero and see what happens. So now we have basically no damper, only the simulated spring. And in an ideal world, we would get an infinite oscillation, which is the mass, in this case, the rotational inertia on this rotational spring, and it would go on indefinitely. In practice with simulation, there can be small numerical errors which inter are introduced over time, both from the process of integration as well as sort of subtle constraint errors. And that numerical noise can actually lead to energy being added to the system. Um, that's just where we are at the bounds of reality versus simulation. And in, in real life, of course, there's going to be air friction and other kind of parasitic friction that tends to move energy, so this won't look quite so good. Let's take a go one step further, though. Instead of being a positive number, let's actually add a negative number. So I'm going to take this from 0 to minus 0.1 on the derivative gain, and then we're going to watch that go. We'll notice that the motions are much more dramatic. So it is still winding up and oscillating around the set point, but with many, many rotations, and the magnitude is steadily increasing. Effectively, what we've done here is, instead of re uh, trying to remove mechanical energy from the system, we're now adding it. As the, as the clock hand moves in a positive direction with a positive velocity, the torque is positive to try to increase its speed. So it's basically pumping the system, pumping the sort of cemented spring of the system to ever greater magnitude. And this will eventually lead to all sorts of numerical errors, and eventually the numbers will exceed the bounds of machine precision. So this is a case which is uh, the simulated result will produce like, very dramatic speeds, but actually does happen in practice. If you, when you're setting up a controller, if you get the sign of the damping term inverted, um, the system can immediately go wildly unstable. It's something to watch out for as a real kind of process. So just in summary here, we have two parallel uh, single axis systems with slightly different uh, physical parameters, but the same controller running on both. And we're watching how the different sort of proportional and derivative games lead to either a, a, a underdamped or an overdamped or a, uh, oh, we didn't really do overdamping. Let's do overdamping just, just for completeness here. If I really give it a lot of damping here and we run it then, what we'll see is a very sluggish performance. By adding a lot of damping, we've effectively increased the viscosity of the simulated damper quite a bit, and now it takes a long time to get to the set point, and it gets there without oscillation. The code actually looks a lot like the algebra. There's a straightforward calculation of uh, the proportional and derivative terms uh, to produce a torque, and the complications mostly come about in terms of bookkeeping and deriving a velocity value.